Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. My name is Robin Osborne, and along with my EAB University colleagues, who are Amy Stone from the Ohio State University Extension and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, we welcome you today to this presentation entitled Invasive Species. We have an app for that. Today's presenter is Joe LaForest, who is an integrated pest management and forest health coordinator from the University of Georgia. Joe was graduated from The Ohio State University with a dual master's degree in entomology and plant pathology. He joined the University of Georgia in 2006 and has focused on developing resources for educating all audiences on IPM and plant biosecurity as well as using technology to enable more effective use and distribution of information. He also serves as co-director for the Southern IPM Center and coordinates the Facilitation of Innovation Through Technology, or FIT, initiative to encourage communication between IPM and plant biosecurity systems. Just before we get started, I wanted to remind you that your comments and questions are welcome today. Please feel free to write them in the chat pod on the left of your screen. We will make a note of them, and Joe will respond to these questions after his presentation is finished. Your feedback is also very important for us to keep these free webinars coming, so please stay tuned until the end when we will be providing a link to a survey that we hope you'll take the time to fill out. For those of you needing CEUs, your survey information is necessary for us to process them. Um, let's see, or, or if you look at down at the note pod at the, at, on the left of your screen, um, please email Amy Stone at the address in that note pod. We can only give CEUs for the live webinar. And also, we will be sending out an EAB goodie bag to the first 10 people who fill out the survey. But even if you've received a goodie bag in the past, we hope you'll still give us feedback on this webinar as well. This webinar is being, re being recorded, and it will be available for viewing later on www.emeraldashbor.info. And all, you will also find all recordings of our previous EAB webinars there. So I want to thank you for attending today. And Joe, I'll, I've got your presentation up, and it's all you. Thanks, Robin, and thank you very much to the EAB University webinar partners uh, for this opportunity to come and speak to you today. It, it's great to see this group is still going, still going strong and presenting some um, wonderful material out there for us all to learn some more about invasive species and where things are at. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about invasive species. We have an app for that and a little bit about what we've been developing for helping them manage invasive species as they're introduced into the country and getting a handle on where they're at and where we need to focus our efforts a little stronger. Um, just a bit of a background of, of the group I'm working with down here at the University of Georgia. It's called the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. But most people know us as the Bugwood Network. We started in 1994 and we were looking at an opportunity to work across different agencies that I'm at the University of Georgia but we work a lot with Auburn and we work with Florida and we work with North Carolina and well there's sometimes some stuff going on up in Ohio and Michigan and sometimes you need an organization that kind of spans these different borders and boundaries to help pull together some materials and make things work out pretty well. The group has really focused on providing easily available resources. We don't want this to be something that, oh, I have to go and fill out this form and request permission, and if I know just the right person to call, I can get what I need. No, this group really focuses on creating freely available tools to help people work together. And once the tools exist, they're out there for anyone to use. It's pretty much self-service. You find the materials you want and you use them. And the reason we are called the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health is because in 2008, we became a center at the University of Georgia. This means that even after uh, Dr. Douse and Dr. Moorhead, who founded the system, retire, um, I will still have a job. We will still exist. 
and our programs can keep going on as a university center. The project I'm going to talk to you today, because we have many different projects, projects out there in terms of images and presentations and other things, is EdMaps, the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System, um, which we set up as a common operating platform for pest invasive species information. We noticed that in many cases people weren't necessarily talking between institutions, between states, between agencies, about where invasive species were at. Um, we started a lot with uh, the Everglades, what was going on with cooperative areas down in Florida, and also working on invasive plants. And it really was, was to us sometimes shocking how there was a disconnect between folks that are in the same area. And so if there was some common platform that all these people could participate in, we could facilitate the sharing of information so that everyone's on the same page, everyone has the same information to work off of, and we can do a much better job of knowing where things are at and responding to them. So with EdMaps, we really do have a national or even international focus, trying to work through existing organizations and network. The system is not meant to be a replacement for anybody. It's meant to work alongside existing systems because systems that have been developed on the local level work extremely well for those local groups. And it's just a connection up to the larger picture that really helps them out. It seeks to aggregate data from other systems so that the distribution data that already exists, that's already in different systems and different locations, can come together at their different scales and resolutions to have a more complete picture of where things are at. People often ask, you know, there's so many different programs out there for doing mapping and where stuff's at. How does how is EdMaps any different from these other programs that are there? This last point of aggregating data, not replacing other systems, really is the key factor that makes us different. We're not trying to replace anyone's system. We're providing a common place for people to come together. And it just so happens that in order to accommodate a lot of different folks who didn't have the IT resources, we have built tools to allow for reporting. So it's, it's an options that help bring people together for a unified picture of what's going on. And so far, this has actually been a pretty popular concept. Here you can see in green different states and provinces that have, have at least some partners in there that are working with us on collecting invasive species data, to know where things are at on a much larger scale. So this is a nice grand overview of what we've been looking at, but it doesn't necessarily tell you all of what we're doing. What we found is that for every tool, there's a tool for every job, and we're viewing EdMaps really as a toolbox for different applications and different sections that meet the needs of different audiences. If I don't have an audience that wants to use the tool, there's not really a whole lot of me producing that. So we have a variety of different tools that are currently in our toolbox from early detection, allowing reports to come in as people are finding things to delineate where our population's at. The verification of those reports so that we have more information and actually ground truth that data to know what was actually there alerts so that people who are interested in what's going on can receive automatic notifications when new verified data comes in. And then having all this data in a pot's nice, but if we can get a picture of it, if we can see it on a map, so we can see where things are filling in, these visualizations pull off all that data that's been available. And then unfortunately in many cases, Invasive species do get established, and they slip out of the early detection. Is this going to establish mode into, well, now we're on to monitoring, monitoring and providing management for it. And with all these tools together, you're getting a whole lot of data coming in. The next part is data sharing and collaboration, how we pull in all of our partners so everyone can access the data. It's not kept in a silo that no one ever can access. It's freely available for people to use. So with this, I'm going to go through the different tools that you see here on the screen, give you a little taste of each of them, and talk a little bit about the development that we've gone through to get to this point. 
So first I'm going to go through our early detection tools that for many of you may have come across the Mid-Atlantic Early Detection Network or uh, up in Ohio and Michigan, the Great Lakes Early Detection Network. Um, if you Google MAIDEN or you Google EDMAPS, e -D -D Maps, you'll find our website. These sites were some of the initial things we created because we figured, all right, we started this back in 2004 with people reporting things in. Let's, let's provide them a simple way. A lot of people can get on the web and they can report different species. So through this website, I can go to report a sighting, choosing my state that I'm interested in, and then choosing what type of, of thing I'm going to report. This helps narrow down some of the options and customize the forms that you're going to see here in just a second. So when I go to re report an invasive plant, I've got my options of, okay, what species am I looking at? What's some information about the infestation, the infested area, what habitat it's in? We can be fairly detailed about what information we're asking for in this case. This doesn't mean that all this data is required. All we actually need to make a report is who it is, which we know by the person signing in, what species they were looking at, and what location they were at. The rest of the information can provide some, some rich data that we can use in other ways, but it's not required. So someone can go in and, and select a particular species from our drop-down list. Um, they filled out other information about the infestation. They've dropped a point on the map to indicate where this particular infestation is at. Or if they actually choose to, they can actually draw out a polygon highlighting the infested area which we then do the calculations to know how big that space is. Down below they can actually select then pictures to go with this report so that if someone's trying to verify it they have a much easier time than well, I have to call the person up or I have to go out to the site. For many species a good picture can actually be quite useful. There's additional space for comments text people want to describe the, in, the infestation, and other information to tell us if they had some identified form, who that was, was a voucher specimen made, was it sent off to a museum, and where that museum might be at. Um, at the end, they filled out all this information, they submit their report in, and they get a record ID, they get to see this records in EdMaps, and it goes off to the verification system that we're going to cover a little, little later. This was some of the initial work we did in providing just a common web place for people to come to. And it was great. It worked out very well for us. But we often found that people don't always want to go to where you necessarily are to submit this information. Because as I mentioned starting this off, we really try to work across organizations and networks. And as, as wonderful as we are, um, we actually like to do a whole lot more to help our partners. They have their own websites. They have their own places where they would like people to go to to report things. So we ended up making up some forms that you see this form here on the North Carolina website for reporting brown marmorated stink bug. And then you go over to Rutgers website and you see a very, very similar form. We're providing these embeddable forms that anyone can put out onto their site much simpler information for what someone's reporting, just where it is, and what's going on, and a few pictures. So that these different partners can keep their members on their sites, still have information coming into the same system without having to go through a whole lot of additional technical issues. Um, it was one way we were trying to help them out with just preserving branding and their mission of what they're looking at. We then continued this from, um, stand, from the standpoint of looking at this is some wonderful stuff. It's all web-based, but you know, I have to remember that I was out in the field and I took pictures and I get back to my office and I get I find everything's hit the fan and I've got fires to put out and you know things to do and I got to go walk the dog and take care of kids. I don't have time to come in and make this report. If only there was a way I could have done this from the field. And we watched the development of smartphone technology come about. We saw what these devices, devices were capable of. That, yes, they marketed the original iPhone as you got your phone, you've got your music, you've got everything you want here. 
we started looking at it and said, well, you've got a GPS, you've got a camera, you've got the ability to take notes, and you have access to all kinds of reference rem material. So this really is the ultimate always with you pest and invasive species reporting tool. If you can have the right software on it, the right app on your phone to enable this reporting. In thinking about how we were going to build this, being that we're actually located in fairly rural Georgia, we wanted to make sure it would work when someone doesn't have a good connection to the internet and when someone does. Because knowing that later he can go to a place where he does have access and access the internet helps out with communication to the server and make sure the app isn't frustrating the user. With this, we can also provide direct connections through that server to other people who can provide verification of what you're looking at. And more importantly, and most importantly in these things, we have connections to response teams so that when an invasive species has come in and someone's trying to manage it, notification out to these first responders to go out and deal with an invasive species in early stages can be very, very important. So we've actually built, at this point, 26 different, uh, different apps for both iOS and Android. The one I'm going to be talking today is the Southeast Early Detection app. Uh, I have to admit I'm a little biased down to Georgia. I've been down here for a little while now. So going through some of the functionality that we've put into this to allow someone from their smartphone to report invasive species in the field. With this, we are always asking people to sign in first because we need to know who it is that's making the report. A random report from a person without contact information doesn't do us much good because inevitably there will be some sort of, of follow-up that's needed to know more information about what was going on. We're also trying to capture whether or not they're part of a first detector program. The first detector programs through the National Plant Diagnostic Network and other groups that have used the term first detector have been a very important movement that we're trying to support through the use of these apps. Once they've signed in, they have this menu of options that are available for different things they can do to look at species by a category, all species we have, a select list of species they've stored in the app because it's their favorite ones, um, providing state-specific lists, the ability to do negative surveys where people went out and looked for something and didn't see it, and then an upload queue so that if you do happen to be out somewhere where you don't have an internet connection you can actually go and save that report and have it go up later. The basic functionality we built into it if you're going in by a category you're picking what category you're looking at picking a species on the right and if you're not quite sure if that's what it is well here's a brief description of it and here's a selection of pictures you can flip through we find that a good set of pictures can go a long way to help reducing the number of, uh, of false reports that we get from different individuals and helps reduce the workload that our verifiers have to go through. If I want to, I can look at the map. This is actually showing point reports. These are only the verified point reports and it's also only the ones where the points have actually been released for people to know about. There are plenty of times that we have people report a pest and, well, Farmer Bob really doesn't want you saying that pest is in the middle of his field. So the county maps that I'll show you later feature that data, but in this case it wouldn't show up on this map. From here I can choose to report. And so I can go out and say I'm reporting this particular species. I can take a picture from my phone and attach that in. I can choose my location. And if you're working with citizen scientists and trying to capture the amount of effort they've put into it, we can actually look at the time spent in minutes to capture what they've been doing. We can capture more information about the infestation and the density. You'll notice that this information you have here, we do customize this depending on what species you're looking at, but it's much, much reduced from what you saw on the web form. We found that with most of our users, they don't want to stand out there in the hot sun or in the cold working on making a report and filling out a 20 question survey of everything they could possibly ask them. They wanted something quick, something easy that they could get the initial report in, 
And if they want to later, because this is going all into the same system, they could go back to the office and add additional information. So they can go in and it'll start off by using the, the user's point to know where that actually is. So if I was out there mapping pythons in the Everglades, I might use this point feature a whole lot more because if I'm two feet away from a python, I'm not going to stand there to make sure I have a good point over top of the python. I'm just going to drop a point later to know where that was at. I can also draw a line around where a particular infestation is and we're actually showing polygons then of where a particular infested area is. Same functionality that was in the web application. It then prompts me to make sure I take a picture. Um, we really prefer to have pictures come in because otherwise it gets to be really difficult to try to validate some of these things. And I save my observation and it's put in my queue. It'll sit there in my queue until I get to a point that I actually want to upload it. So I can make sure I have a good cellular, con cellular connection. It won't sit there and continually try to upload and drain my battery while I'm out there. There is also the ability to do negative reports, so I can include an entire list of species that I've looked for out there in the field, and then I can select the number of, amount of time I looked, the area surveyed, and submit negative data for multiple species at a time. This can help greatly if someone's trying to do a survey and actually being proactive about where things could be at to, to survey for where invasives may be. So far we found with this approach it's been pretty successful. We continue to get additional reports. This, this graphic is actually um, old. We do not have the tail end of 2014 in here, but we are getting a significant number of reports coming in through the system and being processed. We continue to talk with other people to find out more of how they're using the system and ways we can work with this better. We've also done quite a bit with getting in bulk data from a variety of partners. That's actually helped the system grow to the size it is today. We currently have 2.6 million occurrence records in the system with 1.7 million point records, covering about 4,665 species. We get multiple submissions per day and the system hums along making sure we get verification to know where things are at. I mentioned at the beginning and it's a recurring theme throughout. Partners are what make us successful. There is no way that one institution, that one group can do all this work. It requires people on the ground, it requires in-person training, it requires people to really know what's going on and be able to work better with the local communities to know what we have. In that effort, we've made several of our apps themed to a particular location. Each of these different apps features a different list of species because the folks in New England don't necessarily want to re start reporting Burmese python because it's not really something that they're currently on their radar because they haven't made it up that far. They have other plants and, and animals that they're interested in. So each of these lists ends up getting customized based on what the group we're working with, what the people in that area really want to have and what they want to be able to report. The great thing about the system is, if you need a species added, if we have images, a description, and a list of contacts that will act as verifiers, we can add a species in a matter of days to weeks, rather than having to build an entirely new app for an entirely new species that comes in, deal with development, deal with the additional cost. We're actually doing this pretty much for free. People say that, hey, can we have this species reported through this app in this area? Sure. Who's going to be responsible for it? What issues do we have to take care of for verification? And it's very simple to get this in. So the big elephant in the room. All this data is coming in. You're verifying that, right? Yes. We, are, we have a verification process in place so that the people who are familiar with this stuff can get the reports, can look at the data that's been submitted and work with it. When a new report comes in, we immediately break it off into two sections. You have your things that are regulated, that states and federal agencies are going to definitely want to know what's going on with that data. 
the unverified report is not available to the general public, cannot be downloaded, cannot be viewed by anyone who does not have the proper authority to. The information comes into the system, these folks are notified, or their designee is notified, depending on if there's a, a task force dealing with a certain species, and they handle the report. They handle verification, and if the report goes in and is never verified, it is at least been sent to them through one common channel and they don't have to worry about it. We do try to follow up with them periodically to make sure reports are moving through. For non-regulated species, for dandelions, for kudzu bug, for many other things that come in through the system, we have either a, a verifier for a particular species, a verifier based on a location, a state or a county, or we have something based on a project that someone is getting this information, someone does have the ability to look at it and determine whether or not this is actually a credible report. In the case that we don't have any information for any of the above categories, for some reason we haven't had it come through a verifier, we do have an option where there is no verifier currently listed in our lookup. And that goes to the EdMaps administrator, which is usually Chuck Bardron, myself, or Rebecca Wallace. This ensures that at least someone sees the report. So depending what it is, we'll go hunt someone down, work with them, as not only to get the report verified, but also work with them to build out the verifier network. The more people that are involved in it, and the, the broader we can build it, the better it will be. This is a nice diagram and looks pretty, but what most people ask is, okay, so who, who is the verifier for a given state? What's going on here? We've actually made a new tool. We want our system to be transparent. We don't want there to be any surprises anywhere along the line. You go into this tool, select your species. You drop a point on the map. It gives you information then about who will receive the verification email. Is this currently a regulated species? Has it previously been reported in the state or in the county? And what apps are currently allowing reporting of this? Also, if it's an invasive species, who's been listing it as an invasive species? This information can help provide a, a nice transparent view of what's going on, who's interested in it, and hopefully build some relationships between programs that may not always be talking. Um, these tools are available for people to look at and we're constantly revising it as new groups come on board and we realize that there's holes in the, ver in the notification network. When a verifier report comes in, they get an email very similar to this, asking them to review the record online, where you've got the basic information about it. And if the person provided pictures for it, here are the pictures. Um, for kudzu bug, which we've been dealing with quite a bit, I'm amazed how photogenic that critter is. People can take some blurry, really kind of junky photos, and you can still tell just because of the, the rear of the insect that it's kudzu bug. If I were to go online to review this, I then get the full information for this particular record, and at the bottom I'm asked who reviewed it, how did they verify it, who actually did the identification and the date, how credible is that verification? Is it based off of, well, kudzu bug, yeah, it's been found around the Atlanta area, we have many other reports coming around that section, so it's credible that your report is actually what it is, or, nope, I have photographs, and that's how I verified it. With this, we actually have whether or not it's reviewed or verified, whether or not we should show this record in EdMaps, whether the public should be able to see it, and whether or not the latitude and longitude should actually be displayed on any map. There are cases where people do not want to show that data in EdMaps yet because it's a new regulated species or there's something else going on with it. They want to make sure they have their outreach effort in place before they release that information. That information will stay private in the system until it's actually released. We want to make sure that no one is caught unawares when data is sent out. This brings us to the next part, that we've gone through the early detection, we've gone through the verification part of it, now alerts. That as 
wonderful as our sites are and as wonderful as our partner sites are, no one wants to go to that site every single day looking at the map and hoping that someone reported something and knowing that they, they now see a new report. Any user can go in through my ad maps once they have an account, go to their alerts, and create alerts for themselves for a particular species, group of species, for a particular area. When there is new verified data, they will receive an email in the morning telling them there's new data and actually giving them links to the records so they can look at it and just be aware of what's going on. Fairly simple and straightforward feature, but something that we felt many of our users wanted in order to be kept uh, up to date on, on what's going on. Now we get into the part of visualizing data. That It's great that you have 2.6 million records in this database, that's wonderful and all, but you know, to, tell, to hear that it's in this county and that county and another county doesn't really do it for me. I really need to be able to see this in maps. So for any of the reports that we have, once the data's been verified, if the point's been made available, you can see that online and you can scroll through all of the information for a particular county and see everything that was in there, including the original pictures. We also have visualizations on maps, and I mentioned before that in some cases we don't show a particular point on the map. The county level maps help cover that. It helps kind of obfuscate the data to know that yes it was reported in that county but the exact point, eh, we're not going to tell you that. Clicking on this county then gives you the full details of every report that's been in that county. So if you see a county lit up and you're kind of wondering, well you say it's up there, is that real? Well. Who are the people that verified that data? What was the source of that data? Where did it come from? We also have some different abilities on these maps at the top that I could download this particular map, which gives me a JPEG dated so you know the time it was generated, and then this can be used in other places to help make people aware of what's going on. We also are using Google Maps to create point maps that allow you to zoom in on a cluster, it breaks it up, and you can actually get down to right where a particular thing was reported, assuming that someone did release that point information for the public to see. The part that actually makes me more excited about a lot of this is the things we can do with the basic data that was submitted. This is a map of spread of kudzu bug by year. It's one of the cleanest maps I've ever produced and it's based off the real data that came into the system because when it originally came in the data started to accumulate in the system and we could actually just by doing a filter of what year did the report come in we could actually get a map this clean showing spread of kudzu bug this can provide some real interesting questions for other modelers to take this data work with it and say well I noticed you have this giant spread over in 2011 is there a reason why in 2011 it went that direction nearly as much and then 2012 didn't? We can also use this with whatever data is being sent in. That the report forms we have actually have some customization that you can do density, you can have trap counts, you can have different things. So this is actually one we've developed for Peter Yench up in New York looking at brown marmorated stink bug based on trap count and damage that he gave us his categories and we can make this map to show exactly what's coming in the map is updated in real time as data is available and he doesn't have to think about it we wrote the algorithm that picks the color and you're all set based on the data you're recording we're even taking this a bit further and starting to deal with resistance in populations that this is actually resistance to Boscalid by Botrytis cinerea gray mold on strawberry. We're able to take in different screening data that people have done, put that in the system, it's then available for anyone to use, and it's very simple to generate these maps showing low, medium, and high resistance risk based on what data is being re retrieved. Again, these maps are, are wonderful, they're great, and there are on our websites, but, you know, really, I don't necessarily want to come to kudzubug.org every time, or I don't want to send my clientele always to kudzubug.org. Maybe I want to put this on my site. So on top of it, we have a share button. 
you immediately get the information to embed this map as a dynamic piece of content that will update as information comes in. So I can then have this out on the UGA extension site. All information is kept up to date, it's all synchronized, and it's all in real time. Once data has been validated, it comes in and can be shown. We also have some fun with this when we start taking screenshots of these things over time that I can create animations showing spread of a particular insect based on the data that was in the system. All I'm doing is rolling through the data at the top of the map, or the dates at the top of the map, and it's showing me what happened during that season to know how the pest populations grew some very powerful things you can do if the data is in the system that can be easily queried to show stuff what's going on. This brings me into our monitoring and management. That, Like I mentioned, there are unfortunately times where the invasives actually do establish and get into a foothold. And at that point, we get into some monitoring and management, looking at trapping over time, knowing when it's coming out so we can actually target our management activities based on the pest populations. So in this spirit, we've started building this system to allow someone to set up their own sites where they're conducting routine monitoring over time. It's the same location every time when they're making a report. So I can go in, set up my particular sites, I know where they are, I'm assigning different users who are responsible for doing that monitoring at those sites and I'm choosing what species they're going to record data for at those particular locations. Once all that's set up, a user comes in to report something, they pick which site they're doing the report for, they pick which species they're doing the report on, and they can enter their information. Whether it's a trap catch, incident severity, we customize this to match exactly what they're trying to do. So we have the transition from early detection to managing and monitoring. All the data is still available, not only within this system, but to any other partners that want to pull the data and use it. So they can see that their submission was successful, and then wherever we put the map, and this, was, this is not a true map, this is one I was doing for purposes of demonstration in something. This map is updated in real time as data comes into the system. And depending what we've been asked for, we can change this from looking at this data over the entire period of history to within a certain growing season, within a particular time period, to customize the information being delivered to different stakeholders. This brings me to the last section of what we've been doing. I've, I've showed a lot of things for how data gets in, ways we can visualize it, and that's great that it's in our system, but honestly, I really want people to be able to take the data that people have provided, take it into their own systems, make their own models, include weather data on this, do many other things with this data and, and really have this data have impact for the greater community. So with this, we've been looking at, we already have all this data aggregated, we've helped clean it up some where some of the species um, going from free text to having things actually with codes on them and everything nicely arranged so that computers can actually use the data well. You've noticed on all these maps I've been showing there was this block and I've talked about these sections below it but what I didn't talk about is right above it. You want the data for Tree of Heaven that was used for this map? Here is Excel download, KML download, GPX download, and shapefile. Please Take the data that's been made publicly available. It does not contain the confidential pieces of information in it. Take this data and use it. We want people to use this in other applications. Um, we also have some additional ability through how the, the tools have worked to go in and look by species to pick up all the records that are currently available for something. Or if you want something a little more custom, go through and do an advanced query based on a species and a location and an observation date to pull out only the data you really want to be dealing with. It will then show you that on a map and give you an ability to download that so you always can go in and pull what you want. Manual is nice and those data exports are great, but if I have to continually go out to a website and pull data 
re-import it, I'm going to get annoyed really, really, really fast. We are providing soon REST services to access all the data that's available in the system. Um, it's also going to be accessing not only what is in EdMaps, but also all of our image, all of our systems that we run for images, presentations, and video, so that a user can go in, access that data, pull it into their system, do manipulations, do modeling. We're still acting as the repository for that information and providing them data services in real time. Where we really see this working very well is some of the collaborations we've had with groups like iPipe or the IPM pipe which focuses a lot on pest monitoring, having sentinel plots, and knowing what's going on. For EdMaps, a lot of folks get into using the system at the beginning, when something's introduced, when the pests are detected, and you get local establishment going on. But at some point, iPipe is an entirely different system out there. They're going to start up a program, and they're going to start doing monitoring over the area and they're going to bring in multivariate models with weather and topography and everything else worked into it. They need to be able to not only pull the initial data that came in from the initial surveys and delineation that went on, but then as things go on, continue to pull that data so everything's kept in sync. And hopefully, if they're being a good partner, returning data back into it so everyone has access to the information. Availability of information should not be a barrier to what we have to do for helping people get effective management. They've been excellent partners so far and we're actually using them as one of the first model systems for how we can do this well, how this data sharing ecosystem can come together. That we actually have at this point my fields, which is going to be recording sugarcane aphid data. This system is far more based on the notion of someone goes out and scouts, they get to the end, and they have a management decision they make. It's not so much interested in just delineation, and it doesn't really have the weather models in it, but there's definitely powerful data coming in from this. So they're going to be synchronizing with us, so their data is available for the people who have been signed off as verified reporters, people that know what they're talking about. That data comes in and isn't available iPipe has its stakeholders, its risk prediction systems, and everything else, and their people recording data. It is also coming into EdMaps, and EdMaps is act acting as the information broker, passing information back and forth between the systems. This data sharing ecosystem is going to be tested for sugarcane aphid in the coming year, and we're really excited for what the promise this brings for open sharing of, of at least some level of data between groups to affect better management. With that, I've gone through the different tools that we have in EdMaps, where we've looked at how the system is growing and, and a bit of where we're going in the future, trying to make these things as simple as possible. I would really love one day to be able to say, the least problem we have for managing invasive species is exchange of data. It should be something that we can do very easily, let all partners benefit from having information available, and let people be aware of what's going on. I'd like to thank the many people who have funded EdMaps over the years. It's been funded by a multitude of folks who have, who have said, you know, your functionality is great, but what I really like it like to do is do this. And so we've had many projects with these folks to expand the functionality of the system and make it better. Um, they've, they've really been great supporters of all the work we've done. I also have to thank our entire team here at Bugwood. Um, we have a fair number of programmers and uh, outreach staff and folks to help keep all these systems up and also provide training out to people. Um, it's, it's really been a great team to work with over the years. And at this point, I'll take any questions you may have regarding the apps, invasive species, other stuff you've seen, or, or what we may have available. Wow, that, that's just incredible information. I mean, and to have that organized to this extent is just, to me, is amazing. I think that's, that's, this is really pretty awesome. 
So um, we did have uh, one person ask about aquatic organisms, but we had a couple of other folks um, that are participants that said that um, they wanted to know if they were listed, and they said yes um, on some of the various uh, networks like the Midwest, the Missin, and uh, the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app too. So um, I don't know if you'd want to address that at all, Joe. Uh, it looks like in the chat most people end up figuring out that yes, we can always add species. Um, what sometimes if someone's really clever, they'll sit there going through all the apps, going, "Well, this one has this species. This one has this species. Why is that?" Often the the answer is because someone asked. Um, it's a matter of having. Why would I put a feature into a piece of software if someone's not asking for it? We do pay attention to. Um, what's going on, new species that come in, especially because of the Southern IPM Center and my role in that program as co-director. Right now I'm working with the Tawny Crazy Ant group, I'm working with the Sugarcane Aphid group, Crape Myrtle Bark Scale, to make sure that we're getting report forms in there that make sense, we're getting the, the historic data in, and we're making sure they get added to the apps. We're also working with the IPM coordinators at the different states to make sure we're getting the species they care about. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that we could try listing everything in the world, but then you have an app that's giant because of all the pictures. And it's got a list that no one can ever sort through because it's so long. So we try to add stuff whenever people bring it up. Um, Cliff is asking, uh, so who do we need to contact to put a species on the list? My email is right on the screen. Contact me. To add, a picture, to add a species to the list, I need pictures of it. I need a brief write-up, something to describe it so people have something to go off of. And then we need to build out that verification network. We need to make sure we have people who will pick up the phone and call someone or handle the report. Um, sometimes that's the person who has the identification expertise. Sometimes it's the person who just is willing to be the triage, who's willing to be the filter for, I, I think I've got, you know, the creeping crud coming. No, that's a cockroach. No, no, that's a burrower bug. Someone to filter out that stuff and then work with everyone else. Um, verifiers are extremely important to how it works. Cliff also asked then, what critical information do you need to assure local verifications? Um, it depends on the species. If we're talking about a uh, kudzu bug, a fuzzy picture is usually pretty darn good for actually getting me what, what we need to know what it is. Um, of course, I'd love a clear picture if they could actually take one. For something like Tawny Crazy Ant, technically speaking, you have to have a winged male to properly identify that thing all the way down and be absolutely sure. The folks with that Tawny Crazy Ant group are going by a bit of a different standard. They're figuring that out actually today. They have a meeting going on right now in New Orleans for what they're going to consider for that verification. Um, for some things, it may require a site visit. It really depends on, on each situation and what they've sent in. If I were to give advice to people about what you should do, make sure you try to include a picture of the actual thing if you can find it and any damage it's done. For diseases, this becomes a whole nother issue. Um, we do have plans to expand this out so that someone could select a given species like Rose Rosette disease they would then see that they have the ability to send a sample somewhere because we list in our system where a sample could be set where there's testing. The reason I bring up Rose Rosette disease is because there's a project looking directly at that. So what we'd like to do is actually provide when they go back to the computer here is your packing slip, here is a QR code and a website. Put that together into the uh, package, send it off using the packing slip, and actually have it sent off for verification. It depends uh, where you're going uh, and, and what species is as to where that's going to end up.
I see a note from Barbara Phillips. She's getting an unsupported URL error when trying to register an account using the app. Um, Barbara, I will get up with you and give you some customer support to make sure that we get that resolved. Um, we do a lot of testing on our apps. Um, I'm always amazed at, at where a glitch can pop up. Um, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And we try to get down that as fast as possible. Any other questions? I have a Is question. Is there oh, any cross... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Cliff Sadoff asks... Is, any, is there any crosstalk with local diagnostic labs via NPDN? Um, we are working with some of our first NPDN partners to actually get data from the diagnostic labs into the system. Um, Carrie Harmon at University of Florida is working with us on trying to get some of that to happen. Um, there's a lot of issues that come up for people in deciding whether or not to share data. Um, I try to provide as many different use cases and ways that we can actually make that happen, make sure everyone's happy and satisfied with the security of data and what's being said. Um, Carrie is being a pioneer in, in helping us address some of these issues and hopefully get that worked out. The link back to the diagnostic labs when a report is made typically is being made through whoever the verifier network is. So if a group has said, you know what, I really want, for Tawny Crazy Ant, I want that to file through the diagnostic lab, and they're going to deal with it, and the diagnostic lab actually agreed to that, um, then that's great. But in a lot of times, there's someone who's directly dealing with something that is acting as the, the filter to make sure that if the diagnostic lab is needed, then they're called on. Um, I know the diagnostic labs are under a tremendous amount of, of work that they have to get done with just what they already have. So we have to be careful not to uh, overburden them with some of the stuff coming through. Joe, what do you see down the pike for this as far as uh, what kind of ways are you getting um, this information out to folks so they know that this, this is available? So the different ways we've been trying to get this information out to folks, um, through the facilitation of innovation through technology, the FIT thing through the Southern IPM Center, I've been talking a lot with all the IPM coordinators at the different states. Um, we do a lot of outreach events through cooperative invasive species management areas. We're heavily involved with um, a variety of efforts including don't move firewood and we're anyone who's, who's willing to let us come in and chat about this, see what's possible, we're getting that information out there. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with National Park Service and for them they're actually focused more on the park than they are a particular region, and so that's structured a bit differently. Um, it, it's it's I found with all the programs we've had here in about in just under a, a decade that I've been here, it's not there is no silver bullet to outreach. Uh, it will be a continual process of getting out there, spreading awareness, telling people what's there. Um, we're probably going to be looking at. Um, a new approach to this coming up soon that a lot of the things I put up here I, I talked about you can do this you can do that here's how you can pull this information that's nice most of you aren't techies most of you do not aspire to be techies and I can't blame you um, we are going to be working on providing step-by-step -step instruction that tells you you want to do this start here click these options put this piece of code here, this is how this works, to help ease people in across the learning curve. Um, the most effective thing that I found for getting people aware of these things is actually sitting down with them, doing webinars like this, and actually even doing trainings hands-on, showing them how this works, how it can integrate with their program, 
and not replace what they're doing, but act as one tool in their toolbox to make them make it a little more effective and a little less uh, dreary dealing with some of the data that can be in there. It looks like Barbara was able to get in. Yes, excellent. I will still go talk to our developers after this call and we will go attempt to make accounts to make sure that that gets resolved for any other users. Okay, folks, if you ever do find an other if you ever do find an error on anything, you've got my email address. Feel free to contact me. Um, I'm amazed how many times you'll have something that's a misspelling or somewhere somewhere, and no one will tell you for years on end. Um, I, I don't have that big of an ego. You can tell me something went wrong. Uh, and I hear you too about trying to find ways to do outreach that that get to the audience that you're looking for, and to you know have them, you know, respond and and integrate what what you're trying to give them into what they're doing. So I know it's it's a constant it's a constant uh, progress, uh, you know, work in progress. Yeah, that that's where our in-state partners really become key because they know the people on the ground, they know all the players, and we'll support them with the technology. We'll handle the technology so the biologists don't have to, and let the program people do what they're good at. Let's not make them try to be computer scientists. All right, this is great. And folks, um, I w would hope that uh, in whatever capacity that you are involved in something that would be able to use these apps, I hope you would uh, you know, direct your um, your folks to this information so that they can also uh, use it and um, you know integrate it into whatever you're doing. This is like I say this webinar is being recorded. It will be available online here in the next couple of days on www.emerald-bore.info. So and you are free to use that recorded information as you see fit if you even want to use it as part of a presentation and, and bring that up and and uh, show them the recorded webinar, you can do that. So um, with that, I want to thank you very much, Joe. This was just fascinating. It's, uh, it's great that this is out there. I, as a person who's been a communications person for 30 years, this is like, wow, I, I can understand the amount of work that's gone into this. So it's been wonderful for you to be able to share this with us. I really appreciate it. No problem. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Alrighty, we've got a couple more minutes, folks. Um, about uh, I will close the meeting at noon, so please, um, I would appreciate it if you would access the survey that we've got online here and just a few questions on that survey. That way we can um, know how you, uh, you know, may be able to work with us and um, also give us some feedback on what you might like to see again on one of these other webinars. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and thank you, Joe.